supreme faith? Faith of God or just faith in God? If we use the word supreme faith, there's a common understanding of what is meant by supreme. The word faith can be used in many ways, though. We can explore that in a moment. First, let me note that everything that I'm about to share with you will be things that you can recognize as already familiar to you. However, if you've never connected these distinct familiar points, then what is about to happen for you will be like going from having all of the materials for a house stacked up in a pile to having a well-built home where all of those construction materials are snugly assembled and ready for use. <clears throat> and if you have any lasting frustrations in your life, those can be relieved simply by putting together all of these familiar points and recognizing how they all fit together perfectly. You will be witness to the perfection of life and you will experience the awe and glory of that perfection. You will recognize that your life in particular, your life in particular, is also a manifestation of the total perfection in general. You are a manifestation of the supreme perfection. However, you may have been distracting yourself in patterns of reactive condemning of others. Yeah, you may have condemned other manifestations or forms as if those were manifestations of some other distinct source that's not the same as the source from which your own life manifests. You may have condemned other manifestations as if they had nothing in common with you, right? If you've been focusing on in the mode of anxiety on what you say makes you superior or what you say makes others inferior, then that anxious focus would have been distracting you from what is otherwise obvious and even familiar. Again, I'll be stating familiar points and organizing them in a way that may be radically new and um, resonant for you, where you go, oh, wow, that is what I've been waiting for somebody to validate. Like, I knew that that's how it is, but I didn't want to say it myself, or I felt um, skeptical or shy about saying it outright. Well, you don't have to say it. I'm going to say it. You just listen. We'll see if that works for you. <clears throat> so I mentioned that we can use the word faith in a few different ways. So what are some things that the word faith could mean to you? If we think of the story of Moses commanding the waters of the Red Sea to spread apart, some over the left and some over the right, and that's going to allow a group of people to walk across a dry surface where the Red Sea used to be. Well, we might say that Moses was able to command those waters to move because of unusual confidence. Sometimes people use the word faith when they could also use the word confidence. But that's not the full extent of how I'm going to use the word. That's like faith in what somebody's saying, what's, you know, the faith, the confidence of the speaker. Um, that might not be the extent of what the word faith could mean. So when we use this word faith, of course, it's an English word that I'm using in the English language, you know. Um, words like faith have roots in other languages, or basically um, almost all words in English have roots in some other language, right? If not all of them. So what are some of the roots of the word faith? Words like fidelity and confide and confidence have the same root as faith and faithful. And even the word fit, fit in the sense like fidelity, fit, faithful, fit 
in the sense of something that is conforming to some point of reference, like it fits with a prior model or it's faithful to a prior model. Like for one thing to have fidelity to another thing such that the two things are a perfect fit for each other. They're compatible or they're identical or they're copies or, you know, there's a few different ways that we can use that word. But fidelity, fit, and faith actually have a related origin and a bit more distant origin to those same words, uh, fidelity and faith. Our words like bid, forbid, abide, and abode. And, you know, for people who are interested in the full range of details of the backgrounds of the words, so be it. But um, this was, when we say bid and forbid, we're talking about um, some act of, of communication. Um, confide is an act of communication. Um, and to copy something faithfully to the original, that's another usage of the word faith. When I say faithfully, that is made from the word faith. So to introduce how I am using the word faith, when I say supreme faith, I'll point to the, the contrast between two categories in language. One category I'm labeling faith, and one category I'm labeling fear. And back to my example of Moses, if he is um, responding to the threat of um, some soldiers and army that's chasing him, that desperate, you know, intense emotional um, pleading is based on on fear, right? There was a perceived threat, and then based on an accurate perception of a perceived threat, he took some action. That's how I understand the story. Um, a different perspective would be, I don't mind how it goes. I'm aware of threats. Um, I'm aware that there are all these people depending on me, in the case of Moses. And even in the midst of possible threat and people's, you know, fear, like the people depending on me, they may be afraid. In the midst of all that, I could not mind all of those details and have a faith that isn't an act of communication. It would come through in my speaking. It would, it would show up as I speak. It would be evident. But it's not a faithful copying of some other, you know, song. If I, if I sing a song and then uh, you sing it back to me and then I sing it back to you and we say, oh, that was a faithful rendition. That's a really mundane use of the word faith. I'm talking about faith that doesn't involve communication. Simply a state that is a contrast to fear. A inner state. No communication required. Communication is possible. Wouldn't change the core of supreme faith, it would, you know, communicating would express that faith, but there's no communication required, there's just faith. And I'll get into what I think of as a really poetic way of using this word faith. It's not um, a point of argument. It's just one way of using language or one way of experiencing life. And it's not requiring other people's approval or validation, which is actually an important thing. If I'm 
afraid that others might disagree with me, well, that's fear. When I'm talking about the supreme faith, I don't mind what others in general think or what they do or what they communicate. I'm confident, not that I need to display confidence to anyone, I just am confident. If I speak to other people, that confidence would naturally come through or that supreme faith would just naturally come through. <clears throat> so I'm going to use the metaphor of fruit now. Faith and fear have been called the two possible fruits of one's inner state. So the two contrasting fruits, one's a sour fruit or a bitter fruit, the other's sweet or you know tasty. So there's faith or fear. And we're setting that up as an either or of these two extremes. Nothing in between, just those two. Later we'll talk about um, a spectrum of, you know, intermediate, um, intermediate um, possibilities between the extreme of faith and the extreme of fear. But just for simplicity, for poetic um, fun, we'll talk about faith and fear like they're two isolated extremes and there's nothing in between. We'll just talk about it like that for a moment. So faith and fear have been called the two possible fruits of one's inner state. Fear has been called a sign of disorientation, disorder, and even sin. The fruit of sin is fear. The fruit of that inner disorder or disorientation or um, lack of coherence would be fear. And that's natural. Um, that just makes sense. If there's a disorientation, then one is going to seek getting oriented. They're going, if there's one is experiencing incoherence, one's going to seek the experience of coherence. That's just or order. That's just normal. So this isn't f sin from a context of some kind of a, a shaming thing. It's just if there is a disorder or disorientation, then there's more vulnerability to, to fear. In contrast, faith has been called a sign of order or even salvation. The fruit of sin is fear. The fruit of salvation is faith. Faith isn't a method to get to salvation in this way of speaking. Faith is a indicator of a pre-existing state or quality, which we could label salvation. In contrast to sin, there's this idea of salvation. So faith has been called a sign of order or even a sign of pre-existing salvation. It's an indicator. So, uh, in regard to fear, and really faith too, there are variations in the extent of fear, or there's, you know, this whole range between faith and fear. So, uh, let's, let's mention a few of the different intermediate states. There are moderate kinds of fear like alertness, or caution, or being startled. All the way, those are moderate, right? All the way to more extreme kinds of fear like being horrified, or paralyzed with terror, or completely... Um, obsessed about what other people think of uh, some idea or what they think of me or something like that, that kind of paranoia, hysteria, um, anxiety, anguish, those are extreme relative to alertness or caution or being startled or, you know, a little frightened, um, being alert. <clears throat> so in regard to faith... There are also many things that can be called faith. There is a resolute, courageous, undisturbed focus that can be called faith. Focus. Resolute, courageous, undisturbed. That means, when I say courageous, fear can be present, and that would then bring the experience called courage. There's an openness to fear because there's faith in the background. So there's an openness to fear 
which means an openness to courage. That's in contrast to something like um, the New Age paranoia of the fear of fear itself. It goes back to you know U.S. presidents Kennedy, Roosevelt, whoever have made this this statement about you know the fear of fear itself, and they don't want to display fear. So, okay, fine. They are afraid of displaying fear. Whatever. That's not courage. That's paranoia. That's terror. That's being frozen in paralysis of, you know, um, repressing the display of fear. So that's completely obsessed and preoccupied. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ability to focus, a relaxed state that has the ability to focus with resolute focus, courageous focus, undisturbed, not easily disturbed, not currently disturbed, undisturbed, and difficult to disturb like really grounded, really stable, really solid, that kind of faith. We're talking about faith. So that's one kind of faith. I'm going to call that a, an extreme. And another, <laughs> um, another use of the word faith would be in regard to an insistence on some particular kind of uniformity. Like, I want people to um, agree with me um, about a particular creed or about a particular sequence of words. It's often involving acts of communication. So that, to me, is... That's not the supreme faith. That is a faith in a creed or a faith in God in a particular way, a particular God, whatever. Those are all not the supreme faith. The insistence on a particular kind of uniformity doesn't have to be uh, motivated by terror, but it might be. And in many cases, that's what people are used to. We have experienced people using the word faith, and what they're demonstrating, what they're actually doing, is insisting in a desperate, frightened, argumentative way an anxious way. They're, they're, they're using the word faith when they actually mean, re, you know, this state of kind of extreme anxiety, frankly. So they have an extreme anxiety and then they use the word faith as kind of a compensator for their extreme anxiety. They'll say, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm not afraid. I have faith. Or, well, when I'm in the emergency room, then I'll pray. That's not the kind of faith I'm talking about. That's entirely valid. It makes sense that somebody would, you know, all of a sudden, once, um, you know, they're really terrified, then they start to pray or start to be interested in faith or something. Um, but the supreme faith is lasting it's not just, you know, twice a year when some emergency arises. It's not a constant state of paranoia or anxiety where I insist that people, all people, should agree with me or I expect them to or else I'm going to threaten them with who knows what. I'm going to fire them as employees. I'm going to attack them. I'm going to, you know sue them, whatever range of threats there might be, um, those are potentially manifestations of fear. So, maybe someone says in a tantrum of distress, here is exactly what you should believe. If you do not believe that, then you do not have faith. Can you imagine someone saying, that, someone using the word faith in that kind of a script, in that kind of a statement. Here is exactly what you should believe. If you do not believe that, then you do not have faith. And what we notice is that there's all these different fundamentalists who have all these different ideas about um, this exclusive faith, where they have the right faith and all other fundamentalists are insane, well, it's shared. They all have that, 
um, that orientation of this exclusive faith is the only one and all other forms of faith are threats. The supreme faith isn't threatened by fear. Other people's fear isn't a problem. It's a, you know, something to be aware of, something to even be alert to, potentially. But the experience of that tremendous anxiety and tension and um, perceiving of threat based on what other people um, say or what they don't say and so on. That's not what I mean by supreme faith. So supreme faith is not something that should be, that you should strive for, that you should... Um, um, want to have exclusively. That would be ironic. The point here is that you don't strive for supreme faith. Striving is, is a um, movement of tension, a movement from fear. So the supreme faith can arise naturally from salvation, what I'm calling salvation. There's no forcing it. If people pretend to have faith, okay, or to, to, if they pretend to have the supreme faith, okay, you can pretend it, that, you know, whatever, but that's not going to be the same as a <clears throat> spontaneous surfacing of the supreme faith. And it might be fun to pretend to have, you know, to consider what does the supreme faith feel like? How does someone experiencing the supreme faith sit? How do they speak? What words do they use? And so on. That's, that's actually could be an interesting exploration. But that's not a pretense in the sense of trying to trick other people and trying to um, be superior to other people out of distress. If you want to playfully try and trick someone, all right. But to have a tantrum of distress and say, I have the supreme faith, and if you don't agree that I have the supreme faith, then I'm going to really work really hard to convince you that I have the supreme faith. That's distress. So let's go back to this idea of the insistent uh, fundamentalist faith which is not the supreme faith. All of these different fundamentalists with all of their different versions of faith that conflict with each other, that's not the supreme faith. The supreme faith doesn't ever click, conflict with any other supreme faith. Any other person with supreme faith is uh, harmonious with, uh, in, you know, if you have multiple people experiencing supreme faith, they're, they're in harmony with each other. So someone with that fundamentalist, desperate, frightened, argumentative, insistent um, rigidity that they're calling faith, if they have a tantrum of distress about that, they might say, here's exactly what you should believe. If you do not believe that, then you do not have faith. If you do not agree with me and with me enthusiastically, then you will go to a different place after you die, then where, where I will go. And that's knowing that you're going to go to a different place than I will after you die or after we die. Well, that's causing me right near here and now to agonize. Right now in hell for an eternity, that's what my experience is as I await the great relief of dying and going to heaven where I will then continue to agonize out of my loneliness that you're not there with me. So that person, no, that's the end of the quote, right? So that person speaking in that tantrum of distress, that's not the supreme faith. That's a tantrum of distress. <laughs> so, you know, it's relatively obvious here. People use the word faith like they use the word fidelity or confidence or bid or fit or whatever. They can use any word 
in 16 different ways. Faith is the name of, of a woman's name. Faith is the name of a song. Faith is the name of a city. Blah, 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 right? Okay, as a word, people can use faith however they want. If somebody who doesn't speak English learns to make the sounds faith, okay, they can, you know, they can name their dog faith. It's, it's okay. It's not an insult to me for people to use the word faith as a name for their dog. It's fine. Really, it's fine. It's okay if they use the word faith any way that they use the word faith. Why? Because I have a, the supreme faith. So whatever they do with their time and their focus and their language and the sounds that they make with their mouth, that's, that's okay. I have the supreme faith. I experience the supreme faith. Okay, so previously I mentioned that we can contrast these two, fa uh, two fruits or two manifestations. There was faith and there was fear, right? Or I keep talking about the tantrum of distress. Ah! Right? If you don't agree with me, then, no, 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 I'm gonna, then it's going to be horrible. And, uh, right? So, <laughs> in contrast to faith. And the ability to also... Um, have a sense of humor and have fun. Wow, what faith that demonstrates compared to the real terror and desperation we can we can be in fat um, we can sympathize or empathize with people who are experiencing those extreme emotions of fear when they are in a tantrum of distress and saying you need to have the same faith that I do and I don't know. Okay, wow, that is. That's really important to you, isn't it? Yes, it's important because I don't, I don't, I don't want to be lonely when I die. Da, 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 da. Wow, so you really value companionship and I don't know, whatever. So there's a variety of ways that someone with supreme faith can, if they, you know, they, they can interact um, in a variety of ways with people who are in a tantrum of distress. And one of the interesting things about faith is that if I have the supreme faith, then I'm confident that I'll have, or that, you know, my experience, not just a pretense of confidence, but I'm actually open to spontaneous, intuitive responses to whatever happens. Somebody displays a um, tantrum of distress. What model do I need to have prepared to use to deal with the tantrum of distress? If I have the supreme faith, I don't need a model. It's not that models can't be useful. I just, I don't need a model. Or if I'm using a model, um, or three different models I have available to use or whatever, that's, that's fine. That's not, <laughs> that's not that big of an issue. At the point of the supreme faith, it might not be which words I use. It might not be which language I speak in. The supreme faith actually resonates whether I communicate or not. And if there is a um, energetic momentum for communication to arise, then how the supreme faith will communicate in its tone of voice, its selection of words, its body posture, etc., how it will move the organism is something to discover. There doesn't need to be that. Um, paranoia about how am I in the future going to do the supreme faith the right way there is no the right way to do the supreme faith it's not about um, knowing the right way and then assessing is this the right way or not oh that was 90% the right way that was 75% the right way it's not about that what a relief what a relief. So, there's that fruit of 
faith, even supreme faith, and there's the fruit of fear. That could be alertness, that could be paranoia, that could be a tantrum, distress. So those are at least two fruits or two manifestations. We really, we've talked about several across the spectrum, but at least two. And those fruits or manifestations reveal different inner states. They manifest an inner state. So there's the inner state of identifying what is good or evil. And in contrast to that, there's the inner state of totality or unbroken wholeness or integrity, continuity. These two states, the one of identifying good or evil or the one of totality, these two states can also be thought of as extremes between which there are many intermediate states. However, for simplicity, we can imagine that there are just two basic states of consciousness of interest to us. There's the, the inner state of holiness or wholeness or integrity or totality, which we could also call salvation or health, wholeness, health. Those words have a common origin. So there's that state of wholeness, which manifests the supreme faith. And there's another state. It's the state of Obsessing over what's good and what's evil, what to hide, what to display, what pretense to project, what to repress, etc. What should be, what shouldn't be. <laughs> it's all paranoid. It's all distress. One of those states is the state of stress or tension, distress. In that state, it is common for people to value safety and what is familiar to them. It just makes sense. They want the familiar. They associate, they associate that with reassurance. They are so disoriented. Just give me some point of reference. Something that I can start to calibrate from, right? And that's fine. That's what's going on in that case. If things fit their expectations, those things are called good. For the person who's obsessing about identifying good from evil, anything that fits their expectations, not anything, but most of the things that fit their expectations, they'll be called good, right? Things that are familiar, they'll be called good. As I'm even saying this, I'm reading some of what I'm writing. If, um, I'm, I'm reading some of what I'm saying from things I've written previously, if you didn't know. And... Maybe some of what I wrote isn't entirely true. Eh, it's okay. It's okay. But consider that when somebody is in that state of distress, if something fits their expectations, those things might be called good. That's good. Oh my gosh, I am so distressed. Show me something familiar. You know, it's like somebody lost in a jungle or, a, you know, whatever. If they're lost in the wilderness and they see a, a familiar... Um, you know, uh, landmark. Of course, that's good. They're, in, they're lost. They're spiritually in darkness. And then they see some familiar landmark. Well, that doesn't save them, but that's useful to them. That is a good thing for them to have that recognizable landmark. It's also, I'm going to use the example of a child lost in a mall or at a big, you know, event with lots of people like a football game or, you know, like a professional football game, uh, the grocery store uh, that's packed with people and then the fire alarm goes off and people are starting to run and then where's mom? Oh my gosh, you know, they're in there, they're in a different aisle than mom, which is normally fine because they're like eight and they can go and look in that aisle and, you know, they'll be fine or whatever age they are, uh, that they'll be fine. At some point, they'll be fine. But then all of a sudden, the, you know, they don't have their cell phone working, the uh, electricity goes out, or the lights go out, or there's an explosion, or whatever. They're going to be disoriented. And they're going to look for anything familiar. Oh, there's somebody who has a shirt on that shows that they are probably an employee of the, um, of the business, of the grocery store. Great. That's familiar. They're going to be more likely to initiate a conversation with that person with the uh, hat or 
vest or whatever of that store than someone else, than some stranger. Um, if they see um, maybe the the cashier that they've, you know, maybe it's a grocery store where they've gone through there a lot and they say, they see a cashier that they know, that cashier knows my mom. I want to talk, oh my gosh, that I know that cashier, they know my mom. And I'm going to go to that cashier and say, "Did you have you seen my mom? Where's my mom? So whatever, right? So for them, in that experience of disorientation or distress for that child, what's familiar or reassuring is extremely important to them. It just makes sense. The perfection of God is manifesting through their distress, through their attraction to the familiar. <clears throat> so in a state of in a state of severe disorientation, extreme tension, it is completely understandable that people would value safety and what is familiar to them. Things that fit their expectations, those are good. There for those people there or for people in that mode, there can be a lasting alertness or even paranoia in regard to identifying whether we perceive something that is, whether we perceive something to be familiar, like how it should be according to our expectations, or whether we perceive or interpret or label something to be unfamiliar or somehow unfavorable, unexpected, which we may call how it should not be or even evil. So yeah, we were just talking about labeling something evil, labeling something how it should not be, labeling something an offense to God, an offense to my faith. So those are the kind of things that sometimes humans might do, right? We have the capacity for language and some of us are um, not as, maybe not as um, fluent in language, not as understanding of what language really is, and so we get used by language. We get caught up in language. We um, lose our perspective on language. And it's totally fine to say, this is not how it should be. If I am... Um, reviewing a document, right? I'm going to write a letter, I'm going to send it to the court, and I say, wait, this isn't how it should be. This is misspelled. We need to correct this. That doesn't mean supreme distress or supreme tantrum. <laughs> that's just, you know, oh, that's not how it should be. And even distress and tantrum and so on, shame. We can recognize these things as different patterns in human experience. If God is the creator of all things, then God created all of these different patterns, like shame and like um, distress and tension and paranoia and fundamentalism. God, of course, created fundamentalism, but... Uh, it doesn't mean fundamentalism is the ultimate destination or the most favorable experience. Fundamentalism may be not even close to the most favorable and satisfying experience. Maybe not even close to salvation. But there's that use of the word salvation and that introduction of the idea of salvation and that could be valuable. We have that contrast of intense distress and social paranoia. I hope everybody agrees with me, and if they don't, then blah, blah, blah. Okay, we have that, and there's some contrasting possibility in human life that is very far from fundamentalism, but may we may find that um, it's amongst post-fundamentalists that salvation is interesting. They get interested in real salvation 
because of the distress of their fundamentalism. I could say I was a Christian fundamentalist. Um, or I was a fundamentalist in other ways, political issues or personal issues where I was absolutely, you know, sincere and passionate and desperate and terrified to present some particular version of reality, some particular sequence of words is how it really is. And other people's perspectives, well, I'm not very, I wasn't very open to them. Um, I was even repulsed by them or disgusted by them or would attack them or all those kinds of things that we associate with fundamentalism. So, we're talking about tension, stress, that reactive um, compulsion or addiction to labeling evil and to labeling things as how they should not be. It's not just, I'm going to identify spelling errors as, oh, that's not how it should be. It's the compulsion for me to earn my way into heaven, to earn my salvation from a state of not being in salvation or not experiencing salvation or not in heaven, I can have that sense of compulsion to label all these things that shouldn't be how they are and that's somehow going to, you know, justify me getting into heaven that's, or getting to salvation. That's the idea of the fundamentalists, of it, whatever tradition in a political sense if we can elect this candidate, if we can pass that law, then we will be saved from whatever. Global warming. We're not, if we're trying to be saved from global warming, what we know for sure is we're not studying the nature of what's called global warming. We're not global warming. We're not studying the language patterns that result in people labeling something global warming. We're, we're not mindful we would be reacting or in distress if we're trying to get saved from global warming by some specific single isolated source of salvation. Wait a minute. Have you heard the idea that the Almighty God is the only Savior and that political um, initiatives and religious rituals, they're not. the producer of salvation. Salvation is something that arises through God's creation of salvation. When and how God creates salvation, then salvation arises. If God happens to use a ritual, so be it. God doesn't require using a ritual. Not as far as I know. If God does, it's not for me to say. If somebody says you have to use a ritual, fine, that's what they say. If somebody says, oh, a ritual it never makes any difference, that seems weird. Uh, rituals obviously make a difference, but are they absolutely required? Are they absolutely assured to produce any particular result? Uh, I, I would assert that rituals are tools, and... Um, political initiatives are tools and they, you know, we might favor one, we might find a lot of sentimental value and want our children and grandchildren to participate in certain, rit certain rituals. F wonderful. You know, go sit on Santa Claus's lap and tell him what you want for Christmas. If, if, that's, if you think that's fun and, and you like that um, tradition, great. That is just a tradition. It's not a big deal. It's not salvation. It's a tradition. It's not salvation. It's a ritual. It's not tradition. It's a political initiative. Salvation manifests as the supreme faith. The supreme faith can use rituals, can create new rituals, as far as I know. Political initiatives, Santa Claus, traditions, you can do it in Spanish language, English language, Hebrew language, all of it's fine. So, we're talking about a state of distress. I know, it's, 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 it's weird because the more we talk about it, the, the more sense of humor and relaxation I, I'm experiencing. But I'm going to talk about it more anyway because it'll be even more fun and more, uh -huh, even, even more delightful as we go. 
in terms of chemistry, that state of tension of, oh my gosh, I gotta identify what's good and what's evil, what should be and what shouldn't be, and ah, da, 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 that tremendous distress and paranoia, it corresponds to the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol. People in that state are alert to identifying perceived threats. And then in the reflex of an old reptilian part of the brain called the amygdala, the typical responses are either fight or flight. They might even um, flee without running in, in a way that I call freezing. There's even other more complex alternatives, but fight or flight are the basic ideas. We could say fight, flight, or freeze. Or I like to add fight, flight, or fake. That is to make a pretense, which is a kind of flight when you can't run away or there's no expectation that running away will be beneficial. If someone can't run away, if freezing isn't working, then the next thing to do in a state of fear or tension is to um, pretend, to fake, to attempt to, you know, camouflage, whatever, um, attempt in whatever way works to avoid the threat, to, to avoid danger, to avoid injury. Now, there's going to be the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol, there's going to be this range of possible neurological uh, consequences. There could be fleeing. If there's no fleeing um, available, there could be fighting. If fighting doesn't seem reasonable in a particular case, there could be freezing. If freezing doesn't seem reasonable, there could be faking. In all of that, there's um, another issue. And the person who's experiencing distress will never be present to this issue, will never be mindful of it. But there is another issue. Sometimes the thing identified as a threat is not actually a threat. Sometimes people are in such a state of paranoia that even a small um, surprise will trigger a tremendous um, retreat like if you think of a flock of birds all um, landing on the ground, they're all together and they're landing on the ground and there's a sound and it turns out it's like a sprinkler system or something turning on. It's just, it's not an actual cat or, you know, owl or something that's going to gonna eat these little small birds. It's totally safe. It's just a sprinkler system coming, off, coming on, but they all flee anyway. Why? Because it's safe. So they tend to react to it as if it's a threat, even if it's not. Why? Because it's safer to presume that that surprise is a threat. It makes sense. Evolution, God's creation, is that birds flee at a small surprise that might be a threat. If it might be a threat, the first thing to do is flee, if possible. It makes sense. So, sometimes the thing identified as a threat is not actually a threat. It could just be the sprinkler system turning on it might not be a cat. Or if it is a cat, it might be a really fat cat that can't catch the birds because it's so slow. <laughs> so sometimes the thing identified as a threat is not actually a threat. And sometimes things that are in fact a threat can be perceived as safe. And that is actually a much bigger issue. That's dangerous. If things are perceived as safe that are threats, but they're perceived as safe, they're typically going to be labeled as safe. In fact, there might be... Um, people who intentionally go around labeling things safe that aren't really safe. And that could be something to be aware of. What if there are a bunch of people who go around spreading the idea that certain things are safe which aren't actually safe? Huh. That could be a, a threat to be aware of, some caution, some precaution to be attentive to. Um, I wouldn't call that paranoia. I'd call that being aware that labels are just labels. If the FDA, just for a hypothetical example, if the FDA were to label something like thalidomide, 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 it's safe, it's fine, it's safe, use it, oh, no problem, it's safe. Then later, whoop, we made a mistake, it wasn't safe. Well, maybe you want to have a higher degree of caution or a higher degree of precision than what the FDA offers because you may realize that the FDA has a long track record of mistakes. They identify things as safe that later they say, oh, well, made a mistake. It wasn't safe. Never was safe. 
we are wrong all along. Or maybe they identify things as a threat that are, are, are safe. But the thing that is probably more important functionally, practically to be aware of is that there could be things that are actually threats that are labeled as safe and that we presume to be safe when in fact they might be things that we want to have a second opinion on. Let's not uh, trust the FDA necessarily. If we look at their track record and if we look at the nature of their operation and how influenced they are by certain special interests, we might think, well, um, if I've got nothing else to go on, I'll use the FDA's um, recommendation. If I've got um, uh, actual science to go on, then I will use science. If all I've got, though, is the FDA's institutional comments that may or may not be scientifically accurate, like when, in the, when if they say thalidomide is safe, oh, well, maybe their science is really not science. Maybe they're a bunch of uh, quacks and frauds. But since they're an institution that regulates quackery and frauds and all that and all that kind of stuff, um, we've pretty much got to just you know either go with their recommendations or discard them and say I have a higher um, uh, higher standard. I want science. I don't want some institution's um, pronouncement based on special interest lobbying and you know all sorts of other issues. I want actual science. So I want to go to um, see what do f 50 really um, competent, intelligent scientists have to say about this issue? What do a thousand really competent people have to say about this issue? About this issue? And, if, and if it's something like thalidomide, why are people so interested in a um, really radical experimental drug like thalidomide? Why not focus on basic science? Why not focus on electromagnetism and acidity and CO2 levels in the blood and, re and really basic, basic, uncontroversial issues that are generally ignored by uh, popular mainstream science in the West, as I know it. So if you're interested in the FDA's opinion, get it. But why would you be? Why not be interested in science? <clears throat> Why not be interested in the independent observations, even things that you can test yourself? If you're so interested in thalidomide, test it yourself. Read the research. Study it. Or just go with whatever the FDA says. You know, you gotta, you gotta, or whoever you're, the regulatory body that you follow, uh, you know, either you are responsible on your own or you um, delegate that sense of responsibility to some bureaucracy and say, hey, I want that bureaucracy to assess whatever and if, if, if I need to know anything about um, biochemistry, I will wait for the FDA to come knocking on my door and say, hey, we have a telegram for you and you need to know about the following scientific, you know, blah, blah, blah. So do it either way you want. Anyway, so there's such thing as stress hormones, and amongst them are adrenaline and cortisol. And when people are labeling things as threats, um, a lot of times stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol will be part of that process. And if people have an elevated stress level, then it might be relatively easy to deceive them in regard to making them think of things as threats that aren't actually threats and also making them think of things as safe that are actually threats that aren't actually safe. Could it be that governments throughout the world and throughout human history have favored a generally elevated level of stress amongst the population that they govern, amongst the human resources that they manage and tax. Couldn't that be useful? Well, I have uh, strayed from my script again, so I'll come back to it now.
um, is it important to identify possible dangers? I've already said in my ad libbing here, yes, it's really important to identify possible dangers. It's more important to identify possible dangers than it is to identify things that are safe. Uh, if, if something is a major threat to me, I need to know it. If something is safe, then I don't need to pay attention to it. It's the things that are dangerous that I need to pay attention to. For instance, I'm driving in a car. There's 79 cars that I can see right now. Four of them are in the incoming traffic lane right next to me, just right across that little dotted line. I see four cars right there, and they're coming to me. One of them, and the closest one, that's the one. Until it passes me, that is the biggest threat. And the car behind me, um, the car on my side, that's not as big a deal as the one in that oncoming traffic lane, unless, unless I'm really close to the car right ahead of me. Oh, they have their red brake light come on. Wait, maybe I'm going to be attentive to that car now. So there's going to be, amongst all these 79 cars, there's going to be one other car at any given time that I'm going to be most attentive to. And it's not w which 78 cars are the safest, but which one of those other cars is the most dangerous, that is most important for me to be aware of. So it is important, like when driving a car at high speeds, to be able to identify possible dangers. Isn't it useful to be able to see a yellow traffic light and know what that means relative to a green traffic light? in terms of safety and caution. So I see yellow, or I see green and it turns yellow, and I go, oh, it turned yellow. Do I know what that means? Isn't that important in terms of safety and caution? It is. You're right. It is. So be aware that these states or modes of fight or flight can be very useful. I want to be attentive while driving to things like the traffic signals and the, you know, other cars and other vehicles, right? Sirens. Fight or flight responses can be very useful. Reptiles and fish and insects all have the same neurological functions of fight or flight that we humans do. And that is a big part of what makes us, our animal kingdom of reptiles and fish and insects and humans and so on, so different from vegetation. We're, we're different because we have the fight-or-flight response. We have the reptilian brain. It is a huge evolutionary advantage. What a wonderful thing. However, the process of continuously monitoring for danger can lead to chronic tension in muscles as a lasting experience of distress or hell. Yes, when there is when there's constant paranoia and constant stress and constant monitoring for danger and, oh, wow, my cortisol levels and my adrenaline levels are so high, my breathing will be different. My heart will be different. My uh, circulation, my heart beat, my heart pressure, my blood pressure. There will be hypertension, ah, relatively elevated state of tension all the time because there's stress, there's fight or flight all the time. It's distress, it's hell, it's hypertension. In contrast, I might relax. Or in contrast, relaxing, when there's frequent agonizing over issues of what should be and what should not be. That extreme fear, that paranoia, that agonizing, that agony, is not what I mean by supreme faith. But is what some would call hell. What should be? What should not be? What should be? What should not be? Uh, agonizing. That is what I call hell. Or what some people call hell. Not what I call salvation, not what I call faith, the supreme faith. So, in the ancient Hebrew story of spiritual evolution, two trees are mentioned. One is the tree that relates to the stressful state of contin con con continuously, constantly sorting what is dangerous and what is safe, what is valuable and what is trash. And not just trash, in the sense of unimportant, but trash in the sense of, oh, it's a threat. It's something to, don't waste your time with this. Come on, people. One of the two trees in the ancient Hebrew story of spiritual evolution is the tree that relates to the stressful state of constantly sorting what is dangerous from what is safe, what is good from what is evil. We can call that 
what should be and what should not be. We have to sort what should be and what should not be, what is good and what is evil. We have to constantly sort what's good and what's evil in that state of continuous distress or hell. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In that metaphor or parable, we are warned that eating the fruit of that tree, continuing to perpetuate sin, continuing to agonize, continuing to practice that ritual of worrying, continuing to, to just um, react in distress, to continue to stress over things. We are warned that eating the fruit of that tree eating the tree of distress or eating the fruit of distress or sin leads to the experience of shame. And in the ancient Hebrew story, it's uh, the recognition of uh, physical nudity as something shameful, which is, which is, of course, just one way to relate to physical nudity. It doesn't have to be shameful or dangerous. But if you are um, a, a young adult, a healthy young adult, in the midst of um, a really dense population of humans, for you to be naked amongst a group of people who are um, driving their cars or something, it's going to be a big distraction to those people that you're naked probably, and it may be detrimental to your well-being for you to be visibly naked because they may um, punish you. So it's natural and effective and functional and practical to experience shame in regard to physical nudity once someone reaches a certain age level that is where they're developing their you know puberty and all of the physical manifestations of puberty that's going to be relatively distracting um, to people just like it would be distracting if somebody had vomit you know on their chin or um, feces you know or urine or whatever dripping down their leg or something like that's going to be noticed. <laughs> um, in normal circumstances, people are going to notice that and it's going to lead to people saying, hey, you need to clean that up or you need to, you know, cover up your, your, um, if you've got an open wound, if you're bleeding or gushing blood, you need to put a bandage on that. Like, you can, we can get the simplicity of that. It's not that big of a mystery. But there can be an intense distress And we can feed that distress, eat the fruit of the tree that leads to more distress, more shame sometimes. And that shame could be a label for the sense that one is not how one should be. Not that just life isn't how it should be, but that oneself is not how one should be. And that shame or that self-rejection, that self labeling of shameful can lead to naturally to shyness why um, share yourself and, and um, you know uh, display your actual thoughts and experiences to other people if um, you expect that doing so is going to be detrimental to your well-being well then you know it's better to be withdrawn to be uh, introverted to be shy and those kind of things uh, it also, eating the fruit of the, the tree of shame um, and distress can lead to pretense, um, meaning to hide what does not fit some alleged ideal of how life should be or how a person should be. If I know that I don't totally fit that ideal, then I can pretend to hide details in my past or details in my present, whatever, that conflict with some particular ideal or simply don't fit the ideal. Um, I can even pretend that I do fit the ideal when I don't. And that's the state of tension, pretense. There's tension. There's that chronic tension of not only suppressing what should not be, but pretending to be what I should be, even if I'm not. I pretend to be what I should be. That's all a manifestation of shame, right? That's all a manifestation of chronic tension, of... Um, stress. So these aren't things to be ashamed of. This is what shame is. This is a, a exploration of 
what shame is, how it works, how it develops, and uh, as we continue, how it can dissolve. So, eating the fruit of distress can lead to shame, can lead to introversion, to, uh, seclusion, you know, wanting to be reclusive and so on. Um, it also lead to pretending. And it can also lead to condemning others for not fitting the popular ideal. So if I want to really fit in, then I've got to find out what is the popular ideal and then be a police, you know, a thought police for uh, pointing out and shaming anybody who doesn't fit the ideal. So I've got to know what the ideal is. I've got to, um, as much as possible, behave in accord with the ideal and where my behavior or um, life doesn't fit with the ideal I hide that or pretend that it does fit the ideal, and then I condemn others uh, for not fitting the ideal. Or at least I accuse them of not fitting the ideal, even if they do. I still accuse others. Why? Because that shows my loyalty to the tradition, to the popular ideal, to the um, standards of how life should be. And that's normal. That's understandable. Virtually everybody would do that if you were like, you know, not an infant and not, you know, if you have a basic level of confident cognitive function, then that's what you're going to do. You're going <laughs> to do everything I just said. So the momentum of distress leads to shyness. The sense that one should not be how one is. Condemnation of others for not fitting the ideal. Uh, also, this tremendous... Um, Paranoia about maintaining awareness of whatever the latest ideal is, the latest trend, the latest fad. I've got to know what is the popular ideal. I've got to know what I should be shaming and what I should be pretending not to be and what I should be pretending to be. That's really important. It's a state of distress, paranoia, anxiety. And that can lead on to other stages of sin beyond condemnation, such as, um, uh, you know, there can be like kind of um, a distant condemnation of people and then there can be a direct personal condemnation, um, slandering, libeling, um, accusation, persecution, um, witch hunts, uh, punishments, injuries, tortures, uh, ritual human sacrifice of the witch hunts, you know, the Holy Roman Inquisition. We're going to find the people who are heretics and we're going to torture and kill them. Those kinds of um, activities. Uh, again, all of it understandable, oddly enough. All of it quite understandable. But we may realize that participating in those activities is relatively dangerous. I might prefer not to be the one in the crusade, in the holy war, on either side, on any side, on any part of the, you know, the dominant military force or the targets of the dominant military force I don't really want to be involved in the war zone situation at all. Generally speaking, I would rather be outside of war zones. Maybe. Like, consider that. Some people might really like it for whatever reasons, but, um, or they might find it familiar at least. Uh, they might be afraid of, of uh, yeah, I don't need to get into that, but um, they might um, have a death wish and have a lot of shame, and they're like, well, I can't go home until I win this war, so I'm going to stay in the war until, you know, it's done. There's all sorts of kind of um, interesting psychological patterns that we could explore, but we're going to try and keep this under seven hours. So, it's three, I'm joking, under one, under one hour. Okay, maybe one and a half. Okay, it is the rejecting, no, I'm going to be done 10, 15, 20, I don't know, I'll be done soon. So, when we're pandering to this distress, it is rejecting of the Almighty. When we're perpetuating distress, that's rejecting the Almighty by way of rejecting the creation of the Almighty. Any creation of the Almighty is rejecting, rejecting any creation of the Almighty is rejecting the work of the Almighty. It's rejecting the Almighty as not fitting to some ideals of some form of idolatry, some tradition that I value over the Almighty. I'm rejecting some aspect of creation and saying it doesn't fit with the ideal. That is common. I'm just saying that's not a supreme faith. 
not saying there's anything wrong with it, anything surprising about it. It's super popular. All these different versions of fundamentalism. It's just idolatry. It's, it's taking a fundamentalism and saying, this fundamentalism is the right one, and I'm going to discard the Almighty and certain parts of creation that don't fit with my fundamentalism. I know the Almighty is the Almighty, and the Almighty created all things, and whatever pattern of shame or tension or tantrum or war or torture or any of these things that exist in human experience, well, of course the Almighty had to create them, but I'm going to um, display to others um, the, the pretense that those things simply should not be and that the Almighty made a mistake in creating those things and that I know better than the Almighty. And that kind of pretense, again, is popular. So, <clears throat> if the Almighty forms a pattern like idealism or idolatry, then idealism and idolatry and worshiping, you know, fundamentalism instead of worshiping the Almighty, that pattern of worshiping idealism would lead to the experience of shame and lead to condemning others and lead to resentment towards others and lead towards frustration and so on. Sin, all of these kinds of sin, the shame, the condemnation, the resentment, the frustration, the you know, vilification, uh, I mean, I don't mean um, just identifying a assailant or something. I mean, to vilify or demonize, all of that stuff is sin. And all of that sin leads eventually, or can lead, naturally would lead, to humility, to humiliation. Humility. Yeah. And salvation. Isn't it? So, sin leads to salvation. Sin is the path to salvation. Wow, that's weird. Because, um, like, I know that. It's self-evident. It's obvious that uh, only the sinner is interested in salvation. Only the one experiencing fear is interested in supreme faith. But, gosh, that's really different from what most people say. But sin leads naturally to salvation. Sinners are interested in salvation. Those experiencing distress and fear are interested in faith and calm and grace. So for the one in hell, the one practicing agonizing with that momentum of uh, this is not how it should be and I'm not how I should be and all I can do is agonize. Well, for that one in hell, there is shame about not fitting some conceptual ideal of how life should be. And that conceptual ideal of how life should be is what one may worship instead of worshiping the Almighty. And once we worship that conceptual ideal of how things should be, that fundamentalism, instead of worshiping the Almighty, that's um, the passages of in the New Testament, Mark 7, 6, 7, and 8, I believe. Um, that's Jesus quoting Isaiah from the Old Testament, talking about worshiping this fundamentalist traditional ideal of how life should be instead of worshiping the Almighty, rejecting or neglecting the Almighty in favor of worshiping tradition. That's Mark 7.7, 7, and I forget exactly what verses of Isaiah it is, but you can find them if you care. Um, he talks about worshiping me with your lips and not with your hearts. You know me not, and so on and on it goes. So, for the one, worshiping the conceptual ideal of how life should be, and neglecting the Almighty, there is shame. Because the person knows that they don't fit the ideal. And there's also then an, agon an agonizing about how to go from how one is now being how one should not be, which is very important to that person agonizing it in hell. How to go from being how one should not be to fitting perfectly with the worship ideal. There's an agony or an agonizing of how to go from the state of sin to the state of... Um, presumed salvation. However, they misunderstand salvation completely. They're, they're, they're going in the wrong direction, which is understandable. It's fine. Eventually, they're going to realize, wow, that is freaking frustrating. It doesn't work. It's just more and more distress. It's deeper and deeper into hell. They go deep enough, and they go, wait a minute. You know what? I just realized something. I need to 
look around a little bit, and get my bearings here and find a landmark and go in the direction of salvation and actual supreme faith. Wouldn't that be cool? Isn't it? All right. Um, <laughs> so the agonizing. How, what, is it, what is it like? It takes the form of a sincere desperation like this. How do we earn our way into heaven? By fixing ourselves or fixing our government or fixing our industry or fixing our family or fixing humanity or fixing the planet or fixing the problem, right? There's no real faith. There's a sincere desperation. How do we fix global warming? How do we fix political exploitation? How do we fix corruption? How do we fix disease? How do we fix... Um, uh, how, how, how do we fix the things that are broken? How do we fix the door? How do we fix the spelling? How do we fix this autocorrect? It's not working right. How do we fix the, the you know, I get into silly stuff here, but what if it's all kind of silly? The agonizing takes the form of a sincere desperation, like how do we earn our way into heaven? Well, what if there is a fundamental mispresumption there about earning one's way into heaven? There's no faith there. There's distress, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's panic. Masquerading as faith, maybe, but not faith. There's not faith. How do we earn our way into heaven? I don't know. Let's try this. I mean, I say that I know, but I obviously don't know because I'm in distress and I'm concerned about people agreeing with me. And are they in my way and are they a threat to me getting into heaven? Oh my God, if they don't, if they don't cooperate with me or if they don't get out of my way, then I'm not going to get into heaven and so I have to blah, blah, blah. And if, I, if, they, if they don't come to heaven with me, then I'm going to be lonely. And blah, 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 blah. Oh, It's very, it's not very. It's very, it's not, what is it? It's idolatry. It's fundamentalism. It's rejecting the Almighty in favor of worshiping some ideal of how things should be. So the Almighty God creates all things, including all these things we just talked about, all these, you know, these, you know, horrible things, hell and paranoia and agonizing and so on. God creates language and also all contrasting categories in language. God creates light and dark. Let there be light. Let there be heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. God creates day and night. God creates love and hate. God creates peace and war. God creates good and evil. God creates. So, um, I forget exactly what, I think it's the second book, um, or second chapter of Ecclesiastes. Um, there's this long list of, you know, um, there's a time for peace and a time for war, a time for love and a time for hate, a time to reap and a time to sow, and da 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 da, and it goes on and on. Um, I think that's the second chapter of Ecclesiastes. The um, I for, I forget the verse uh, that talks about God being the source of evil, but there's another verse in the Bible that I recently quoted, but I don't recall the actual verse. And I make a lot of references to the Christian uh, scriptural tradition because it's f most familiar to me and because on the internet I speak English and there's a, a lot of um, uh, easy access to um, Christian scripture, scriptures for people who speak English. If I happen to speak Arabic, then I would probably be um, referring to some other scripture besides the uh, Christian tradition. So, supreme faith is supreme faith in every language, in every tradition, or without regard for tradition. Tradition is, is not really an issue at all in regard to the supreme faith. Um, so, some reject God and assert that perhaps up to one half of God's creation is imperfect or should not be. And they take that seriously, not like it shouldn't be spelled that way, if you want to spell it right, and if you want to get an A in spelling class, then you spell it like this. It's like, no, people shouldn't spell wrong. What? Of course people are going to make spelling errors. If you want to train people in the, you know, standards of, of spelling that are commonly accepted, that's totally fine, but it's not that people shouldn't spell wrong. Like, you expect infants to come into the world knowing English? Are you an idiot? You know? And in many cases, we... Humans are idiotic. I, I admit it. I, one time, oh my gosh, I was, yeah, I know. It's a surprise, I know. Because you think you're so, you're so like, you know, mature now. And you're so, you know, oh, awesome and perfect. Well, guess what? One time I was a fundamentalist and I was an idolater and da-da-da-da-da and da-da-da. 
So I, reacted, I rejected whatever percentage of, of God's creation as imperfect and as what should not be. It was fundamentally disturbing and, you know, uh, disgusting and all these, you know, horribly terrifying things. And because of my terror, which shouldn't be, I shouldn't be terrified, because I sh my terror shouldn't be terrified, uh, because my, my terror shouldn't be um, uh, displayed to others. People shouldn't know if I'm terrified. Well, I did lose track there. Um, I got uh, got lost as far as where my uh, where I was in my script, but I know I was talking recently. I, just, I don't actually know what got recorded. Is what happened? I was I know where I was talking, but I my recording device uh, <laughs> got uh, stopped the recording, and I'm not sure where that happened. But um, <clears throat> so I reject all these. You know, I don't want to be terrified. Um, because me being terrified, I need to hide that from other people. That was my perception at one time, right? And could be in the future. It's it's an understandable um, mode. Um, so if uh, if someone is hiding the display of terror, then they they want to reject everything that's disgusting, disturbing, distressing. They want to reject all those things and avoid them and 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 say those things shouldn't be. They want to experience relief from all those stresses and all those triggers. However, to do that we could call that blasphemy against God if we're going to the point of saying God shouldn't have have created those things. If we're taking the position of, of uh, sincerely positioning ourselves as knowing better than God, um, that's blasphemy against God. And I'm not saying that that's super important because uh, we're talking about poetry here and metaphors. Blasphemy is just a a useful category and language. God is just a useful um, unit in language. So sin and blasphemy and all these kind of things, rejecting some portion of God's reality is not fitting the ideal that I worship. That sin leads to the experience of shame because I'm not um, a perfect fit for whatever ideal of how I should be, so I experience shame. And both sin and shame are God's creations. Even blasphemy is God's creation. <clears throat> what other source could there be? What other source could those things have? Because those patterns have. Does one worship an almighty God? <clears throat> but then assert that there's some other power that creates perhaps half of reality or 20% of reality, whatever the evil, disturbing, distressing, disgusting stuff is. Oh, that's created by some other source. If we focus on this idea of an almighty that is the um, single creative process behind all manifest forms, that is actually a useful uh, emotional, psychological, neurological tr learning tool. What if everything is created by a single source or by, you know, there, there's not two different sources there's, or two different processes. Reality is, in its entirety, the perfect... Um, reality. There's no other reality that's better than this reality. This is the reality we've got, and it's perfect as God's creation. God created us as perfect. God is perfect. God created us as perfect. God created reality as perfect. Why would we reject God's perfection? Well, sometimes that's what humans do. They repress their own perfection, or they talk um, about themselves as less than perfect. Why? Because it's actually God's doing. God sets up a perfect sequence of events in which we use language of imperfection as a contrast with language of perfection. <clears throat> People may even assert that there's some other power like evil that creates half of reality or 20% of reality or whatever, and evil is this big influence or the devil is some big influence and God is threatened by the devil and blah, 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 blah. And they're not really monotheistic. They're really splitting their worship between these multiple powers. Maybe it's two, maybe it's seven, I don't know. So does one even assert that there's some other power which is so frightening to Almighty God that we must condemn that devil to eternal punishments and to, you know, um, we have to confine that devil and we have to put the devil in prison and in hell for eternity. We have to suppress the devil and suppress the negative emotions and put it in Pandora's box and lock the box tight and then throw the box in the, in the bottom of the sea and, you know, weight it down with the chain. And Those are all mythological stories that, that have relevance to human um, 
experience and also could be programming tools. They could be stories that are actually used in order to suppress the display of certain emotions. When we tell a kid a lie about Santa and say, hey, Santa is this really rich dude, really powerful and magical, and he goes around all over the planet and gives every kid a toy by coming through the chimneys because everybody has chimney in their home, right? And coming through the chimney, and um, you've got to be good, though. You know, we're going to go over to the mall, and you're going to tell Santa what you want, but you've got to be really good, okay? You've got to be obedient to what your parents and your teachers and, you know, your babysitters tell you you should do. And that whole situation of, of like, hyperconformity is a... Um, potentially unfavorable or unfortunate circumstance. It may be something that we consider um, unfavorable that we would have to manipulate or lie kids or that we would attempt and choose and probably be successful uh, manipulating and whatever, lying with kids, lying to kids to... Uh, uh, you know, tell them there's a devil and there's a boogeyman and there's, you know, hell and there's, um, uh, if you don't, blah, blah, blah. Well, on the other hand, that's what we have in our lives. So if, if what we have is a density of human population, we don't want our kids running out in the street because there's muggers and there's cars that are traveling at 45 miles an hour and we just, we want our kids safe because we care about them, then one of the things we might do is lie to them might tell them about Santa Claus or tell them about the boogeyman or tell them about the devil. We, you know, whatever. Why do we do things like that? Because it may be functional to do that. It may be effective to do that. It may fit our purposes to be deceptive. Um, so those with the supreme faith aren't opposed to deception or corruption as things that shouldn't be. They just recognize, oh, that's corrupt, that's deceptive. Okay, so those with supreme faith can let the devil punish itself with its own shame and its own agonizing. Maybe they punish it additionally, maybe they don't. Whatever, not a big issue. The devil will worship idealism and fundamentalism of how things should be until the devil encounters humiliation and experiences humility. That's how it works. That's how God uh, does it. Apparently, that's what I've experienced in my own life when I've played the role of devil uh, or fundamentalist or idealist, uh, I encountered humiliation, frustration, exhaustion, disappointment, all of, all of shame, all of a variety of things that led to salvation and the supreme faith. Those with the supreme faith have no lasting resentment for any pattern of experience, no lasting rejection, no lasting uh, animosity, you know, no lasting sense of disturbance or, or disgust. We may experience disgust or feel disturbed or feel, dis or feel disoriented or anything like that, but something like that. But we have no lasting resentment for any pattern of existence if we have the supreme faith. God creates all things, including resentment, including idolatry, the idea of the devil, blasphemy, fundamentalism, God, religions, traditions, God creates all that, salvation, sin, blah, blah, blah. However, resentment, contempt, all of these things, frankly, all of these patterns are all temporary. Resentment is temporary. No matter how long it lasts, it ends. Sin and eternal punishment in hell is a poetic idea. God is more powerful than hell. If God, who created hell, said, okay, hell was eternal, but it's not anymore, you're released. You have, you have salvation now. You have the supreme faith. If God says that stuff, who am I to question that? 